man, you want to bring me my notebook? kid I was raised by a woman who tried to my mom was uh, extremely overprotective and she tried to shelter us and keep us from the world but in doing so we didn't really learn anything about the world so um, uh, in my early teenage years I started getting into some trouble with the law and stuff and mostly because I wanted to, I was eager to get out and learn about what was going on outside of the, uh, outside of the home, so I just kind of ran away a lot, um, you know, probably, probably 15, or 50 different times really over five years, like it was, it was a pretty regular thing, um, it became so normal that I just flagged down a cop as he was driving by and be like, hey, I'm on the other side of town, I'm ready to go home. So, um, yeah, so I, I, one of those times uh, I got picked up by the police, I had gotten into some trouble, I'd been drinking, and they took me, uh, they took me to the jail, they were going to keep me there to like let me sober up, and I told them as soon as you, you know, send me home, I'm going to leave again, I'm done being there. So they they told me my only other option was to go to jail, so I agreed to it. I was like, yeah, take me to jail, I'm not going home. So uh, that was where I first got put on probation, and I met like my first real friend who's on probation with me. And uh, after I had gone through my whole probation period, uh, I basically gave my mom a dilemma where I had my friend down the road that I just that I met that she knew I'm either gonna go live with him or I have a friend in another city I'm not even gonna tell you where I'm just gonna disappear so she let me leave but my where I went and stayed with my friend was kind of a flop house for drug addicts and so that's where that's where I started doing drugs and um, kind of became, those were the only kind of people I knew how to associate with. Those were the only people I knew how to talk to. And uh, so me and my buddy that I was living with there, um, we kind of we kind of started going off the deep end a little too hard. And we had talked about trying to get clean together. And so we started trying to fight towards that. And uh, a friend of his that he knew from when he was little kind of came in. He came into the picture, and he was on some real hard stuff. And so he dragged my buddy down with him. So I told him um, what he, he didn't realize what he had done walking back into the picture. He was just happy to be with his friend again anyway. I told him what he was, I told him who he was, the man he was to his daughter, and who he was to his best friend, and how that affected my life. And I guess I, I opened his eyes to who he had been in the wrong way, and 
a couple weeks later, he stepped out in front of a semi truck. And so I kind of blamed myself for that. So that kind of kept me in my dark world for a, a really long time. Um, thank you. <laughs> I learned right there that my tongue had the power to break or build whatever I wanted to do with it. And so I kind of used it as a weapon when I wanted it to be a weapon. But um, yeah, put a, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. So I, I tried to build a sort of a self-righteous outlook on becoming friends with drug addicts and because really I just wanted to get high. But once I was done, I'd try to convince them to get clean with me. And then once I got them clean, I'd just kind of ditch them, go find the next person, get high on you know a different substance and just kind of play around like that. And so outwardly to other people, I kept this self-righteous thing about me that I was helping people, I'm helping people, but the truth was, you know, I I had done the opposite too. I had taken people who had gotten clean in the past and got them to get high again so that I would have a friend to get high with. Um, So, I don't know, I, I would say all of that was me running from the, you know, the buddy who killed himself. Um, so, Chris Berg, his name was Chris Berg. Um, so, I... My dad told me to come and move to New Jersey to come be with him to get out of the way I was living and I tried to, I tried that. I, I moved across the country from Arizona and um, I guess I was doing okay. I smoked a lot of weed, I drank, but I wasn't really on anything too crazy. I was mostly just being a kid and running around. Um, me, I met a dude there who lived here, he was from here, and I got real close with him, but he was kind of a, a fight anybody, you know, always ready to take a life kind of person um, who had been through a lot and always kind of created, created hell around him. Um, but I had fallen out with my dad and he was kind of the only option I had he had just moved down here so when I had a falling out with my dad I moved down here and um, yeah I started popping pills again when I came down here and uh, kind of the way he had told me that Beaufort was and the people I was around when I moved here kind of made it true that this was the place <coughs> where nightmares were made so I came down here ready to die. I came down here with that mindset that I didn't care what happened when I got there. If it killed me, great. So I was, I went pretty hard. Um, I went pretty hard on drugs when I got here. And uh, oh, I was not doing very good, but I still had my self-righteous thing. The household, I, but I lived in a trailer next to the household. I kind of became everybody's therapist. So I'd straighten myself up enough just to tell them what they needed to hear. And then once everybody went away, you know, like they might not see me for three days because I'm just wrecking myself. Um, and, and one day I was coming home from work and um, 
her name is Christy. She's the, the property owner there. And she had a friend of hers over. Her name was Melody. And uh, Melody told her, you know, like, she's like, who's that guy? You know, I want to know. Call, get him to come over here. So uh, she's like, Jit. They called me Jit at the time. Juvenile in trouble. Um, she's like, Jit, come over here. We'll talk to you. She so came over. She introduced me to Melody. And Melody knew God, even though she was lost at the time. I think I think now that that was the Holy Spirit telling her, like, that one right there, that's yours. Right. Get him to come over. Yeah. So, uh, we hit it off real quick. We, I mean, we were, we were both drug addicts, but we ran around. We had so much fun together. I'd never, uh, I didn't want to die anymore. I didn't want to die anymore. I was having so much fun. I had somebody to ride this thing out with. Things were going really bad there, but we grew really tight, so I, I decided I had had enough and I was going to move home. I was going to go back to Arizona. I asked her if she would come with me, and she agreed. She didn't even question it. She's just like, sure, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> so we literally left that night. Um, we left that night. Uh, we drove across the country. We s slept in some water runoff thing, pulled our cars over, and, and crashed there. And that night, I was like, this girl here in the middle of nowhere with me, this is totally my style to be in, a, in this place. But I can't believe you're here with me. And I felt, I knew I was in love with her that night. We were just having fun at first, and it was great. But I knew I was in love with her that night. Um, so we got to Arizona and we were doing all right for a little while. I know the dude I had come down here behind moved out there with us. Uh, he, he had given me a place to stay, so I thought it was only right to give him a place to stay. But he brought a girl with him who had been on meth for 30 years. And so um, stayed in a hotel room, asked if we could get something for him, and we did. And it started a whole nother, a whole nother dark road. Um, three months into it, I think I would uh, kind of lost my mind. Um, it broke me in a way, I guess, it didn't really do to other people. My mind wasn't built for it. Um, thing that makes all of it make sense is oh well why it broke me is because I had this idea that I could be whatever I wanted to be when I met new people and I would tell stories and I would tell lies and make people have an outlook on me that I wanted fabricated rather than letting them see who I was that was part of me running from myself so having all of these lies and things that I was trying to keep in order inside of my mind, when I started doing when I started doing meth every day, um, it all just kind of became one big mess, and I had no idea who I was three months into it. Um, and Melody didn't really know. Melody was by me through all this. She didn't really 
know who I was, but I was falling apart inside, and I just laid it all out to her. I told her who I was and things that I had done, and that, you know, everything you think you know about me is basically a lie. And she, she didn't care about any of that. She said, I don't see you any different than I did before. I love you. And I was not good to her. I mean, I was so messed up one night. She was trying to stop me from taking off in my truck. She was sitting in the driver's seat. I kicked her and I reached, I reached past her, opened the door, and kicked her in the face, knocked her out of my truck. I took the keys, jumped in the driver's seat, and took off. And, uh, I said it this morning. Um, it was the fact that she grew up knowing God, and she had been saved, but she was lost with me. She was lost again. And going down the wrong road. And I gotta think that it it was it was God's grace towards her that kept her from getting consumed by everything I was dragging her through. Um, so that, that mess like that went on for a long time. Um, it just kind of kept getting worse. Things that I did kept getting worse. But uh, I think 10 months of, of doing it every day, um, my my dog died. That was my awakening that I needed to get off of the drugs. Um, my dog died on the on July fifth, um, and because we were out partying on the fourth of July came home, hadn't slept in three days, and we passed out when we put the dogs outside. And uh, my dog had a heat stroke and died. Melody woke me up at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., just tears rolling down her face. All she said was kangaroo. And so I flew out the door and I blamed her, and I was like, I'm done with this. I'm getting off of this. So you can either do it with me or you can get gone. She was just like, all right. We'll get off of it, we'll get clean. So she got off of that with me when down the road, when it came to, I want to quit smoking cigarettes. She quit smoking cigarettes with me. Um, I don't know, everything. I wanted to quit drinking. She quit drinking because I had a drinking problem. She was like, I'm not going to add to your drinking problem. I don't know. For feel like I'm getting jumbled up because I'm talking about her. <laughs> it hurts my heart. Um, so after we got off of the drugs, I kept drinking for another two years or so. I, I, I kept drinking real hard. Um, Melody had completely sobered up, and she stood by me through all of it. Um, was a year and three months after getting off of drugs he was born my son was born and uh, I drank right up to it I drank through it um Yeah, we fought about it, but she never judged me for it. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this.
so we we got into a big fight. Um, he was. I missed his second birthday because um, she moved out here, or I think it was his. Was it his first birthday? I don't even remember now. That's what alcohol does. But she moved out back out here to be closer to her family. And I missed his birthday. And I was drinking the whole time. She called me up, video chat, trying to make me feel better. Like, look, you know, this is what you have to fight for. We're just on the other side of the country. You need to get it together. So uh, I eventually made my way out here, too. And she gave me another chance. And she took me back in with open arms like she did every time. Um, I, I did sober up once I got here. I sobered up and quit smoking cigarettes. Um, Um, so for a year there after I first quit drinking, um, I kind of knew that the only reason I wasn't drinking was because I had people holding me accountable, but I knew that if they weren't there, I'd be drinking. Um, I didn't have the strength to do it on my own, and, uh, um, Uh, things were kind of rocky between us through a lot of that and it was totally my fault so I wasn't I was acting like I wasn't all in so afraid of commitment I'm always been living a life ready to run and uh, she left me recently um, actually it's been like six almost six months now since she moved out um, at the beginning of this year, um, she left me, and uh, I, I started down a really dark road again. I started drinking hard, drink vodka. Um, and I got to a point where I was, I spent like every night for a week, I kept putting the ladder back up tying the rope around the tree every time it got dark. And I just drink around it. And uh, I was like, I've been fighting for so long, like trying to rebuild myself, but like she was holding me together. And uh, you know, obviously that's not enough. Um, I got down on my knees one night um, because just everything was so confusing and I got down on my knees one night and I begged God to give me eyes so that I could see what, what I needed to do, what I needed to be because I was completely lost and I had an overwhelming confidence and what the next step was. So I started trying to straighten myself up over the next few weeks um, or over the next couple of weeks. I, uh, I got the alcohol out of my system and I was trying to fight getting the alcohol out of my system and even though I had asked God to give me eyes and he let me see for a minute, like it wasn't enough, right? He gave me it for a minute, but he's like, there's more to do. And so I, I understood as I'm like getting ready to start drinking again and I'm trying to fight it. And I was like, I had to, I had to kind of do it again. Lord, you're my savior. I know that you died on the cross for me. I know the only way, the only way for me to get this sickness out of my mind is 
is you. Amen. Amen. And and he did. And I haven't had a drink. Amen. Um, yeah, in, in almost three months. Amen. Yeah. I haven't had a drink in three months. I had, I had started smoking weed and cigarettes all at once at the time, but I dropped it all again. Amen. Um, yeah, yeah, and so then I was, uh, I dug into my Bible, and I was trying to get serious, and, um, I was reading, I was trying to study, and I was doing it on my own, and I just kept praying, because I kept finding scripture that was talking about, you know, we're supposed to have a congregation, Amen. we're supposed to, we're supposed to be meeting up, so I just kept praying about it, and I was tried going to a different church before before here and I just had an issue like with with my son and being crazy and I, he wouldn't go into the kids room he's like no I'm gonna sit with you but I'm gonna make a bunch of noise during you know like all right um, so I, I kept praying for like a place that felt like home and and then the family invited me here and it's just been an absolute blessing. Amen. And Pastor Mike's been teaching me now and helping me. I've been growing spiritually. Amen. Uh, yeah. Um, that's where we're at today. I don't know. <laughs>